The biggest nutrition BS, scams, myths, whatever you want to call them, that you may be falling for. Dr. Pack here, straight from the Medical Association of Bristol, where they kicked me out and they said, Get out of here, you're not a licensed physician. And I was like, yep. But I am a real doctor. And then I sat there arguing with a security guard for four hours about what it means to be a real doctor. Here to talk to you about some of the biggest nutrition BS you often see out there. <sighs> what should I go for? Starting with muscle supplements, and now by muscle supplements, I do not mean creatine monohydrate or whey protein, but rather supplements that are sold to you as potential game changers for muscle building that will add pounds and pounds of muscle to your frame without them being performance enhancing drugs. You may remember a pill by Muscle Tech that they were selling as the muscle pill or the scam by Greg Doucette um, that came in the form of turkesterone without any turkesterone in it. But in generally any supplement that you see out there that is promoting significant increases in muscle mass is likely to be a scam. Now, you can check the active ingredients of that supplement because usually they are blends of, you know, a plethora of ingredients that may have some literature behind them to show that they could potentially aid in some muscle increases in specific populations, in specific circumstances, but in most cases, we're talking about completely overhyped supplements that are not going to deliver anything near what they offer. Check out examine.com, a website where you can type in a supplement or an ingredient and see what the actual literature behind that supplement says. This latest product that may have come out promising massive gains is probably a scam. Next on the list is pre-workouts. Now, pre-workout supplements are fine in the sense that if they contain a solid amount of caffeine, so if you're ingesting 150 to 400 milligrams of caffeine, you are going to get an energy boost from that pre-workout based on the caffeine specifically. But the synergistic effect of every other ingredient in there is likely not going to play an important role as far as your performance goes and as far as your long-term gains go. The current literature on pre-workouts is meh at best with current studies showing that in some cases even when compared to coffee they don't seem to give you much of an edge and given that the main ingredient in pre-workouts is caffeine just opting for good old coffee or an energy drink or just having caffeine in the form of a tablet is going to do the trick Keep in mind that pre-workouts come with a heavy placebo effect via the naming, via the packaging, and obviously the promotion by the athletes that promote pre-workouts because they get paid to do so. It's totally fine if you wanna have the odd pre-workout session here and there with the lads where you go to the gym and you have 500 milligrams of caffeine from the latest, I don't know, real doctor pump, uh, explosive diarrhea formula pre-workout that gives you the tingles because of the beta alanine, but it's not really doing much more than if you had just had a few cups of coffee totally fine to do that here and there but thinking that you need to buy a pre-workout or that a pre-workout is going to actually make a meaningful difference as far as your long-term um, hypertrophy and strength gains go is simply bs additionally Consuming insane amounts of caffeine close, like you know, six hours out of your bedtime can impact sleep, which is much worse for muscle building than you not taking the pre-workout and having a good night's sleep. Uh, at the same time, regularly consuming a ton of caffeine is likely to have an effect on your tolerance level of caffeine, and you may need more and more as time passes which eh, is not going to kill you, but at the same time, you will be becoming less and less sensitive to pre-workouts, which then creates an inefficient environment where you're spending money to buy a product that is not really giving you much more than just plain old caffeine, and you're just stuck in an endless cycle of 
depending on a hefty dose of caffeine to just get your workout in. Ideally, don't rely on a ton of caffeine to get every one of your workouts in. Use caffeine as a supplement when you really need that boost. Another nutrition myth or scam that is still alive to this day, especially when it comes to shedding body fat is the idea that low carb diets are somehow superior to consuming carbohydrates or having a diet rich in carbohydrates for fat loss and just for muscle gains in general. The current literature on low carb diets and their effect on muscle building does show that you can still build plenty of muscle on a low carb diet and you can still make gains. However, the literature on low carb diets and fat loss clearly shows that as long as you're in a calorie deficit, whether you're consuming more or less carbs is not going to make any meaningful difference as far as long-term fat loss is concerned. Now, when it comes to short-term weight loss, low-carb diets are likely to lead to greater results, but we're specifically talking about weight, not fat, simply because you will lose water weight when you drop your carbohydrate intake. And the idea that low-carb diets are superior than just regular diets that include carbs for fat loss stems from the idea that obesity is a result of increases in insulin via the ingestion of carbohydrates where fat uh, utilization is negatively affected and you're therefore storing more fat versus utilizing them and so on and so forth. That model that was developed in order to explain obesity has time and time been proven wrong in the literature when we've looked at studies where carbohydrate intake was controlled and we compared people consuming similar calorie deficits, but some consuming carbohydrates, some not. In every study that we have examining whether that model is true or not, we've consistently seen that over the long term, both high and low carbohydrate diets lead to similar outcomes as far as fat loss and weight loss go. The idea that low carb is somewhat magical for your health, for your performance and for fat loss specifically, is BS. Another nutrition slash supplement scam that is still alive for some reason is the use of brand chain amino acids. Now, I don't understand how in 2024 we're still on about BCAAs and whether they're useless or not, but time and time again, BCAAs have been shown to not give you any additional benefit if you're consuming enough protein throughout your day. Also keep in mind that protein intake and gains, yep, those things are important, but at the same time, it's, it's the training that is the most important thing for you actually growing muscle. Now, whether you're consuming the optimal amount of protein to absolutely maximize gains is a different story, but keep in mind that if overall protein intake can only make so much of a difference, the addition of BCAAs on top of that protein intake is going to do absolutely nothing for your gains. Yes, there may be scenarios where if your protein intake is insanely low, you can and you have some BCAAs lying around and for some reason you cannot eat food for days and days, days in and days out, and you can only rely on BCAAs, maybe there's some utility to them in that context. But even in the context where you're missing your pro, your the optimal protein intake, aka around 1.6 to 2 grams per kilo of body weight, um, if you're missing that a day here and a day there and you're still engaging in resistance training and you're still consuming some protein, it's unlikely that you're missing out on a ton of gains. But BCAA supplements, uh, either presented as intra-workout supplements or as whatever post-workout or pre-bed supplements are complete BS. Lastly, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a great way for you to manage your calories and manage your caloric intake throughout the day, but the data is piling up against intermittent fasting being any form of magic bullet, even when it comes to things like appetite. More literature is showing that intermittent fasting is not really making any difference for weight management, weight loss, the appetite and for gains as well. It, you can you can make great gains while intermittent fasting, but the idea that you're, you're boosting your growth hormone and you're gonna be, uh, gain more muscle and burn more fat and all that BS that we used to hear back in the day is simply not true. Intermittent fasting is another way for you to manage your intake. And in some cases, training fasted may actually be deleterious 
to your performance be somewhat deleterious, right? It's not gonna be the end of the world, but if you're somebody who's trying to absolutely maximize gains, training fasted may not be your best bet. Still fine, you're still gonna grow muscle, but it may be best if you're fasting to train while you're fed, so while you, you know, you've broken your fasting window. So when if you hear again that intermittent fasting is the way to go when it comes to building muscle, losing fat, managing your appetite or your overall health, take a step back, take a deep breath and go, wait a second. And then just show them my video and just watch them laugh at the mess that I am. And then be like, look, now we can be friends, right? They will forget all about intermittent fasting. You'll shake hands and who cares at the end of the day? It's not that deep. But in all seriousness, intermittent fasting consistently being shown to not be a magical bullet. And take it from me, I fast every day, not because I want to live forever or because fasting is magical, but simply because I don't like breakfast and I like having my coffee and then eating after a few hours. And I've also done intermittent fasting specifically controlling my eating and fasting windows when I was younger, going as crazy as 20 hour fasts and four hour eating windows every day. And I did that for quite a few months consistently. But do not fall for the IF trap unless you really like to manage your caloric intake and have a specific fasting and feeding window. Also, keep in mind that you, within that window, you can eat even if you're you can break your fast and have a few calories and that won't make a difference the whole idea is again for you to manage your calorie intake it's not that you're gonna stop some magical process that is happening just because you're not fed and you know if you decide to have your coffee with sugar or a bit of cream and you do ingest 100 or 300 calories of whatever during your fast that's not going to really to change anything as long as you stick to your calories throughout the day. It's also important to note that fasting specifically can be somewhat restricting if you're traveling or if you have social events to attend and so on and so forth. So if you have an eating window that doesn't coincide with those events or with your schedule, it can be restrictive for no actual benefit. You're not gonna live longer, you're not gonna lose more fat, you're not gonna build more muscle. You're simply choosing to not eat when everybody else is eating. And that can make you a party pooper and negatively affect your psychology, your relationships. You're gonna get, you know, your significant other will divorce you, your family will leave you, and here you have it. Intermittent fasting, the worst thing you could potentially do for anything, any sort of metric in your life. Just kidding, intermittent fasting, totally fine, but not a magic bullet, by no means. And there you have it. More scams, more myths debunked here in the wolf's lair. Another day, another dollar. I bid you adieu, which is German for I love you. And don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification icon and hit your screen because you're so excited that another video is over and you made it till the end. I appreciate you. Send me money, please. My bank account details in the description. Until next time, free the guys. Whoa!